morning, Nick, my brother. How are you? Brecker, great. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, actually. You know, lots of things happening at the moment. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's actually good to talk to you. We had a, a bunch of guests. Like, we had a series of episodes with guests. We had the wonderful Kathy again. Kathy, who we love. Uh, we, we love were, and we who we disagree arguing. with. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we love her arguing, yes, and we, we don't like anything she says. <laughs> no, we, we like a lot of what she says, but we were arguing this last time. Yeah, so yeah. Kathy and then uh, Dorothy. And ABJ, right? We had our series yeah. of uh, episodes about our top journals, and we've got to continue that. We're, it's just scheduling is sometimes a bit difficult with some of the editors in chief. They tend to be very busy people. Well, we had ABJ and Dorothy, and I just felt like, look, there's there's a lot of topics that came up, right? We obviously talked about the journals. We talked about the basket of 11 or whatever they call that now. Uh, with For Dorothy, sure. we talked about the premiere list, right? With Dorothy, we talked about literature reviews of all things. And with Andrew... We also talked about career moves, right? Career advice. Yeah. So I think it's a good idea that we just go and tie up a, a few of these loose ends. I think, you know, I had the feeling we didn't quite finish <laughs> some of these discussions, right? What do you think? Yeah, uh, sure. Let's do that today. Uh, you can lead us. But, but before we do that, I do want to say that I was at a thing this weekend. It was uh, Virginia. So a bunch of universities, which, by the way, I really love this. I saw something on LinkedIn where a bunch of Texas schools were getting together, their IS groups and doing like a, a regional like a round table or something. Yeah. Over the weekend, it was uh, University of Richmond in Virginia, along with like University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, oh, George cool. Mason, uh, Virginia Commonwealth. Right. Uh, Alan Lee, who's yeah. retired, by the way, yeah. was came to the workshop. And he's engaged and it was so, so I did a little presentation. It was so cool seeing Alan Lee who, <clears throat> and you know, one of my arguments is that every study we do, whether it's quantitative or qualitative is just a case study. And that's yeah. how we should consider it. Yeah, right. I know. Uh, yeah. So, and here's the guy who wrote like the case study paper 35 years ago or whatever in MISQ, the first case study paper in my audience. I thought it was so cool. And, and then I met him afterwards at dinner. What a warm, uh, pleasant human being, right? And a brilliant guy. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely humble. You know, like all of these great names, the old generation, I think there's there's much to take away, right? Like these, these greats of our field, not only are they great and intellectually brilliant, and they said, you know, they have seminal papers, you know, and all that sort of stuff, Right. But like him and Ron and also Carl, they're humble. They're, they're wonderful human beings. And, and to some extent, yeah. can I say that? They're much better than the yeah. current superstars. Than us. Yeah. <laughs> we're, like they're way yeah. better people. Yeah. The current superstars tend to be egomaniacs, either very fragile egos, or maybe it's the same thing. Maybe the people with the most fragile egos are the ones who come across as the most egomaniacal, right? Because the, maybe there's something there. Uh, and then there's you and me. What are we? We're not the humble. Well, we're also not the superstar. So I think that's yeah, fine. You know, if you're not the superstar, you can be a little bit of an asshole too. <laughs> Is that it? All right. And then I was told, I won't tell you who said this, but they, she, she told me that, uh, you know, I don't know how you should take this, but I listen to your podcast. I feel like I know everything about you. You know, she told me that, uh, of, I'm of Hungarian descent, all these things from the podcast. And she goes, wow. And, but I could tell, you know, I'm very surprised that you're not an alpha male. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm not. I'm a beta male or something, apparently. And uh, it's because she said I'm like kind. So apparently her view of an alpha male is someone like just mean and aggressive and, and harsh. And yeah. she thought I was far more kind and nurturing. And But I actually think it's part of being a, an, a true alpha male is is to be kind, right? Here at Notre Dame, we have this uh, tender, strong, and true idea, right? The strong and true, we always identify with being a man, but I think the tender part is important too, right? Yeah, I like that. I like that. You know, it's, uh, uh, I would say like people, folks, uh, we can do a little bit of a poll here. Who's the alpha male? Who's the alpha male? <laughs> <laughs> I might just win that one for, for some, uh, be unbeknownst if you win that one, I'm going to Beat you like a drum next time we see each other. <laughs> um, hey, so Nick, so we have a fair few topics. So I, I thought one of the things I wanted to do is, you know, in the discussion with Kathy about the extension of the basket to this list of premier journals, what we we basically it was a great episode because we had we basically pushed three different views, right? The that's a good thing. You said it it basically eliminates the whole point about it. And I said, get rid of it altogether. And I stand by that. I still think the the purpose 
of that basket, the objective has been fulfilled. We should get rid of it. We don't yeah. need it. It's my argument. Your argument is that it's watering down uh, the quality of such a premier list by having too many of them. And I did not say in this episode because I was pushing this other point. You know what? I fully agree. So it's a small community. There's easily up to 30 journals. And it can't be 11 of them can't be top. That's my view. Yeah. Like we can't have 11 top journals. I don't think that's helpful either because if you – if you want to have a list of top journals, and I, I see to some extent that it can be useful that you have, this is the top outlets, right? We have Nature and Science, these are the top outlets. And then there's a whole bunch of other journals below that. That's fine. And I think there's a, a value for this, but I don't see the value of that being a very, very long list. It completely defeats the purpose. So that's what I think. Yeah, I agree. Having said that, yeah, sorry. Uh, having said that, one thing I did, like, I know many of these journals. I don't know INO, but you know INO very well. I know INM mm -hmm. and DSS as an author and reviewer for many, many years. It's they're great whatever, journals. They're great All journals. Three. So, so whatever, uh, whatever I'm saying is is not actually meant to speak against these journals. They're they're fantastic journals and so forth. I just don't think that a field like IS, the size of this field, can sustain a a, a top journalist of eleven top journals. Yeah. Well, so. I agree with you. So there are two takeaways I have, and I think I mentioned one of them, either talking to Dorothy or or Kathy, but uh, the one is this is an opportunity for JAIS, right? Yeah, that to, was an interesting implication. To, yeah. to now be the time, the real premier list is are those four, MISQ, ISR, JMIS, and JAIS. And if the AIS in their uh, rankings website would just get rid of all the journals except for those four, and that would uh, propel. So if someone at AIS had some vision for this, um, if they would just cut the rankings to those four journals, that would immediately put JAIS in a premier category with the other three, right? And and uh, I think it's there in the minds of many, and it, uh, you could just solidify that in one in well, one. Well, and the other point I wanted to make, so I agree, and and you haven't seen this. We talked about this, the lack of transparency, but I have seen this this actual document with the review and the rankings and the comparison and the data and all this. And the way that I see it, and I mentioned this in this episode, they're literally all the same, man. I mean, uh, across all the different criteria you can think about, cycle time, number of submissions, acceptance rate, uh, impact factor, um, um, uh, you know, editorial board. You know, seriously, if you take, they, they put these 11 journals and a few other candidates is there as well. And if you literally take out the top row, which has the names of the journals, and I would give it to you, you would not be able to pick ISR, MISQ, JMIS, JS, you would not be able to spot which of these uh, uh, columns is which journal. They're completely identical. It's complete, not identical, but they're completely indistinguishable. So if you look by the fact, by these types of metrics, the ones that we have to evaluate the quality of a journal, you know, we 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 assign more meaning to some of them. We say that ISR and J, um, MISQ are top, but that's just what people say. Like the metrics yeah. don't show that. They're not actually better. They're not faster. They're not ha harder to get into. They don't actually even have more submissions. No, by all means. Well, when you say they're not harder similar. to get into, they are. There's a, a bit of a selection bias, right? People will send their best work there. So if 10% of your best work gets it. So, so uh, yes, what you're saying is more or less right. But if you're getting un differentiated products sent to them, then the, the rejection rate maybe doesn't mean as much. Which is also, uh, I think, though, so one thing could be like make th this, what I'm talking about, this document. Document. Why isn't this public? Yeah. You know, first of all, it's all based on public data anyway. It's not a secret anyway. So why mm. don't they take this document and say, hey, guys, this mm. is the data. Look for yourself. See, you're getting to be like me. By the way, when they introduced me, when they introduced me at the Virginia thing on Saturday, no, um, don't say it. It said, <laughs> "Nick Ferranti, man of the people." <laughs> yeah, you're the man. Of, you're the man now, of the people. You're, you're doing, like doing what you're doing is you're sounding like a man of the people now too, Wrecker. It's like we are men of the people. I, you know, Good. I've written a textbook for for everyone but the elite scholars like th there's yeah. no point for them in reading this book it's not meant for them it was meant for yeah. people like, like me that come from me. institution We're... that don't have that training and they don't have the same privilege in in, in their upbringing and their education you know so what's that yeah. is that elitism how's that elitism yeah. see we're both men of the people record you're <laughs> you're i'm bringing you i'm i'm ridding you of your remaining elitist ways uh all right but here's the one thing and i want to do some digging here uh 
I'm curious to see what's going to happen this year with ISIS, ICIS, right? Because, uh, all right, so who props up our field? Yes, there's still a big US centric whatever, but if I look at it, the two big growth markets and in information systems China are and Germany. Germany and China, right? Absolutely. So, so those are the two places that, so if I were running AIS, I would say, well, of course, we need to do a lot of stuff in the US. And we need to do stuff in Germany and in China. Yeah, I'd say so too. So why are we going to Hyderabad, India for this conference? And I wonder how many people are going to go. Uh, I've talked to, I talked to some folks recently. I don't know anybody going to Hyderabad. It's a two day trip. This is not about Hyderabad, India, but to be honest, I don't want to go either. Not because it's in India or anything, but it's a two day trip to go to some place one week out from, it's, it's, it's shitty timing, yeah. uh, you know, it'll be a lot of effort. So Hyderabad is actually very cool. It's 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 ISB is there and that's where I went yep. to work. And I think it's a, a cool place. I think when people go there, they can visit some uh, cool Indian heritage. I think uh, Hyderabad's fine. It's got high tech city there, some nice restaurants. I like it. What you said is it's in December and it's a two day trip there, a two day trip back. I personally, I'm not going in there. I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to have two daughters in college this year. They come from college. You know, I'm not going ISIS anymore in December yeah. until my kids are out of college or something. I don't get right? that. Yeah. This is so I won't be going. So it has nothing to do with so much with Hyderabad. I'm just wondering <clears throat> if your field and you're growing in China, and you're growing in Germany. How many ISISs did we have in Germany? Well, we had the one in Munich. Right? That's it, right? Is that the That's only it. one in the history of, right? Now, luckily, it's in the recent, it was right before COVID, COVID we had Munich. But China, we haven't had one. I guess we had uh, We had Korea, one in, in, in Shanghai. Nearby. We had one in Shanghai in 2010. There was? When was that? Yeah, in 2010, I think, or 14, okay. one of these years, yeah. Yeah. I didn't go, but Shanghai is awesome, right? It's yeah. a fantastic place to go. Yeah, look, well, but that's I, mean, just I, it. I, I like, like their, the, I, yeah. I do like their rotation principle. That's fair. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, and you know, I also know that they looked at uh, finding different dates, but they don't, the, the real, reality is also, they don't find better dates than that. It's not a good mm. date, but it's, it's really difficult to find a better date. It always works for some region, but not for others. And it works for some community, but not for others. So it's, it's not ideal. So I, I guess I'm, I'm not too fed up with this. I'm, I'm just, the reality is I probably won't be going this year. <laughs> Because, mm. uh, you know, I don't, that sounds like a, a lot of effort for, for us. You travel too much and you've got little kids. <clears throat> exactly. Right. So I wanted to ask you one question, you know, wrapping up this this, this basket. So um, you know, to be honest, like to me, it already lost the, the, the meaning. Like, I, I don't know whether I had a lot of meaning. Uh, yeah. And I said this at the end, like I don't in, in, in making a decision about where to submit a paper. Well, to be honest, all the journals that I've ever considered are now in the premier list. Like all of, these are these are just my go to journals, like not even all of them, but most of them anyway. So now I don't have any means of distinguishing it. What I wanted to ask you, can you give me one journal that you think is really good, but it's not on that list? Just one. It's an IS journal. Oh, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, you know this journal, Information Systems Frontiers? Yeah. I so have one experience John, there. Horrible. <laughs> oh, my experience was just great. So John King. So I'm working with Karina Rushi. Uh, she's a former PhD student at University of Bern, and she went to industry. Mm -hmm. So she has this nice little, it's one of the papers from her dissertation that she and I worked on. And we want to get it out. But since she's going to industry, I know she's not going to have a whole lot of revisions to it or anything. So I was talking to John King about it because he's at communications ACM. I'm like, do you think this is a CACM? He goes, you know what? Why don't you send it to Information Systems Frontiers? So we went there. Pretty quick process. It's accepted. So it'll be forthcoming. So I looked at it at the website. You know, they have a... Uh, impact factor of five <laughs> they've like one of the best impact factors in our field and yeah. here's a well here's a, yeah. and it was a pretty it was a what three month process to essentially so I've, i have a paper there too to um it's, it's been around for a long time yeah? yeah so it's been always been there but my experience with this we we got a paper uh, published the review process was average you know not too bad but not too good either but then it got accepted and then it took three years easily until it actually came out because the, the list of forthcoming papers i'm not sure it's better now but have a look at this they've published four mm. issues and if yours is on page nine or something you'll you'll it'll come out 2026 so we had a paper in 2016 that came out in 2020 or something and again this was it was completely irrelevant by the time it came out wow. and so that was a bit annoying to be honest 
Yeah. So we'll just publish it on like ResearchGate, a uh, previous version or something right now, and then just say it's from there or something. That's yeah, the beauty like that. of now. You don't have to wait till it's actually published. But all right, you asked about two journal. Uh, you asked about journals that aren't on the list that are excellent. And I will give you two sleepers okay. that I think are really good IS journals that are really prestigious, at least here in the US, across the university and across it. But for whatever reason in the IS field, we don't give them the credit. And it's because of their relationship with IEEE and yeah. ACM. Yeah. So okay. IEEE, Transactions on Engineering Management, yeah. loves IS yeah. papers. You can publish yeah. an IS paper there. It's IEEE, it, it's it's total, which is the engineering society. So yeah. IEEE, Transactions on Engineering Management is basically an A anywhere in the university except the business school. Yeah. And then the, the, the ACM, there are two of them, but really the big one is ACM transactions on MIS, ACM, yeah. TMS. But yeah. then there's, of course, that we've talked about before. The, the database ACM for advances. Database, right? yeah. But the nice thing about both of those is they're ACM, right? The computer science uh, profession. And fact is, IEEE and ACM carry a hell of a lot more weight than any sort of AIS or or UT Dallas list yeah, or financial right. one times of, one list. One of my or... own fin personal bucket list items is I want to get into IEEE, uh, transactions of software engineer or transactional engineer management, one of these two, because they're top IEEE outlets. Absolutely. Yeah, the ACM mm -hmm. ones, I've, I've done those, very happy about them. No one cares. <laughs> you know, in the business school world, no one cares. No, they don't count and blah, blah, blah. Well, they don't but everybody count, else but read them. the world cares. Yeah, oh, yeah, CACM, yeah, yeah absolutely. Communications of the ACM. Communications of the ACM gets more eyeballs oh, yeah, yeah. than Harvard Business Review. Right, uh, you publish something in communications, the ACM, like five hundred thousand people see it first day. You know, yeah, absolutely. because uh, everyone that is a little bit in computer science or software engineering, they all literally have a monthly subscription to CACM. Still, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah, I fully agree with you. So the one thing I want, I like both of them. Um, I had a trouble finding one. So ACM database is a classic IS journal. It is right. It's run by IS people. Uh, it publishes uh it has some cool sections like it's got this philosophy corner right it publishes yeah. uh theory papers i remember dorothy saying and she was right in a way she's like well if you submit have your theory paper and you submit it to msq and jis and gets rejected where do you go i think it was a fair comment but the one place where you can go is the acm database for advances because mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. at least historically that was the place, right? The idea was that to to have new ideas there and then the proper study in one of the classic journals, right? And I still yeah. think that kind of works to a, to a way, right? Yeah. You can publish your theory there and then the empirical study somewhere else. So that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. I wanted to say one thing where I think hopefully our field or any field is going. I think at some stage, we're going to move away from journal level metrics, like impact factor, journal ranking list, all these sorts of things to really article quality metrics and article impact metrics. I think, as usual, the reason we have this focus on journal and outlets is very simply that's where we could get data on. Yeah, It was a lot easier 10, 15 years ago when we didn't have any good metrics. When then we had journal impact factor and, and so forth, right? And we had this ranking list. But now these days, everything's on Google Scholar anyway. You can look up any article. You can look up any citation. You can look up whether the yeah. citations to the <clears throat> citations are actually from decent places. So I think at some stage, we're going to move away from the, uh, uh, this paper must be good because it's in a good journal. Because we all know there can be good papers in bad journals and there could be bad papers in good journals. Everyone knows this. Yeah. And it is possible to construct data on articles. So I think at some stage, all this quality talk and ranking talk will go there. Yeah. That we look at yeah. what is a good paper. For example, by you know citations. It's a, it's a crude measure, but I think it's already better. Like there's a paper that has 5,000 citations that has left more of an impact than a paper in management science that has two citations. Simple. So I'm going to make the exact opposite argument. Okay. okay? And that's that. Uh, so we look at citations as a shorthand. So it's like, forget the the journal quality when we all know there are crappy articles and good journals, right? Uh, so let's look at citations because that'll tell us the impact. Except for the fact that citations now, we have these citation hunting papers, right? You know which ones I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the ones where we hurry up and publish the first paper on, you know, the term blockchain, metaverse, whatever. Chat We're GPT, our, dude. Chat our, GPT now right Chat now. GPT. So it's like, all right, quickly publish in a journal, get all our buddies and, and be the first paper to say this thing. No real intellectual content, 
But now when you're writing your paper on chat GPT, the metaverse, blockchain, whatever, you, have to cite you go to Google Scholar, put it in, you see that, and then you cite that really crappy paper that people put in sometimes without even a review process. It's just an editorial or, or something. Uh, yep. The problem is now those people look like they, they get a whole bunch of citations from that article that had no real intellectual substance. It's a bad Wired Magazine article, right? Go to CNET. You'll see a better article on chat. You can go. I can show you on my Twitter feed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Better uh, uh, thinking, more substantial thinking about chat GPT than you see from some of these crappy academic papers that are coming out that will get that first, that, that set of uh, citations, right. right? So so I don't think citations is the answer either. Uh, I think it has to be journal quality, my friend. No, I think I think it has to go to some sort of article quality level. And and you're absolutely right. This can be gamed as well. And at the moment, I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. People are starting to game the article citation system. And what you just mentioned is exactly this example. I saw I saw a post this morning about, in fact, the Chat GPT paper. And it's clear. It's you know, it screams gaming. There's 30 people on that paper. It's not reviewed. Mm. It's an editorial. Like they put it out and it'll gather, you know, 500 citations in no time just for the fact that it's, I don't know, that it has a lot of people on it. So I think it's, mm. it's, it's a very clearly a gaming, a, you know, a clickbaiting Getting citation, citation gaming citation kind gaming. of thing. So it's citation gaming. And here's why in the past we used to think of citations as impact. We can't anymore because now everybody, we've said it before with the uh, clickbait and whatever. We This clickbait uh, scholarship, this citation gaming, that's not scholarship. And anybody who reads it knows that this is not scholarship. And uh, I think the way to hedge against that is to have a strong gatekeeper. And right now, the strong gatekeeper are the elite journals, MISQ and ISR and JIS and JMIS. I know for a fact, if you submit something there, if you make a research commentary there, that has undergone my research commentary and ISR. I have one. It went through five years and six rounds of review or whatever, four years and six rounds of review. Uh, there will be peer review and oh, it yeah. will be uh, quality work, right? Uh so, I mean, I don't know. The The fact is, it has to be journal gatekeepers. Now, the problem is that in IS, our top journals are incredibly slow and incredibly time-consuming, and yeah. they, they miss the boat on so many things, and they're risk-averse. We were talking about this at the thing in Virginia, right? They We are so risk-averse. We're so afraid of publishing something that isn't entirely valid and entirely perfect methodologically. And the reviewers have all the power that what gets in is a much more watered down version of something cool that maybe was the second submission. I think yeah. I think this is an issue indeed. I was actually having a conversation with an editor in chief about this uh, recently because again, a late stage rejection. As editors, we did a late stage rejection and felt pretty crappy about it. And we had an honest discussion about are we. I think we're making too many type two errors. We're rejecting yeah. papers that should, in fact, be published because we fear yeah. so much that, oh, my God, we're publishing paper that people will look at and saying that's not the strongest paper ever, like a type one error, right? And yeah. in a way, we always like the, the, try, the way that I try to tell myself, and I'm not very good at this either, but I'm trying to, it's just a PDF. It's just a PDF. Nothing happens. Yeah. Even if you push, if you publish a paper that's per, maybe not as perfect, nothing happens. The world's not going to, you know, the good ideas will mm. survive. The better rules will not survive. So, in fact, we should be more concerned with type two. Journals should be more concerned with not publishing papers that they should have published because then, you know, so uh, mm. especially because you can get everything published anyways somewhere. Yeah, there's so the no question space becomes, limitation. Who gets the best papers, right? Yeah. Instead of looking for that perfect paper and, and so forth. So, yeah, I'm with you there. And it was interesting, I, I thought, to see how, how Andrew and Dorothy, you know, how they saw uh, the roles of the journals, didn't you think? I mean, um, this, you know, Andrew talked about this intellectual custodian of the field, you know, sort of be the beacon. Yeah, isn't that cool? And they both kind of think about that uh, as well. You know, they both think about that. So, you know, one of the things that struck me are some parallels that we have between this episode with ABJ and Dorothy. So, so um, 
you know, with, with ABJ, he talked a lot about incentive systems. Remember that when he said like, look, the people have different incentives to publish in these journals. And then we talked with Dorothy about JIS and it struck me that we had so vastly different experiences. You basically said you never really submitted until last year when they had this really cool, you know, the, 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 the promise option. Promise. And I said, well, that was actually my first ever submission somewhere, basically, wasn't the first, but you know, the first big, that was my first PhD paper uh, was at JIS. And it's hmm. probably I haven't looked up I haven't looked it up, but it might be the the journal that I've published most of my papers. I'm not sure it could, but I'm, I'm, it would be right up there. So completely different experiences, and I think Andrew has a has a fair point. So we we do come out of completely different systems, yeah. And I mentioned hmm. this very briefly where I said, look, we don't have a bad acceptance rate or something at MI Squadly or some of the other journals. We just never submitted. I think I submitted to ISR twice in my life. You know, JMIS, yeah. I, I, I submitted once and didn't make it, but neither of these two. But it's not that I have, you know, zero for 20 or something like this. We just really just they were not the journals that we went for, probably because they didn't matter too much. They were the top journals, of course, but it didn't really matter all that much whether you submit there yeah. or somewhere else. And that's where, where I came from. And you had this vastly different experience. I thought it was striking. Yeah, I think in most of the world, except for maybe, I don't know. It might just be North America, really. Yeah, it's like 50 universities in North America. You got to realize there are 800 accredited business schools in the United States, right? Of which somewhere between 50 and 100 uh, are have have information systems departments, right? Uh, or maybe not even between 50 and uh, have information systems departments that focus on ISRMISQ, right? The, the other... Say if, and then a lot of them, I guess, maybe don't worry about publishing too much. There are a couple hundred schools in the U.S. do not care whether it's okay. MISQ or JAIS. Similarly, I think most of the world is like that, where if you get a good journal publication, you get a good journal publication. No one really worries about which mm -hmm. level of elite that journal. And I think, and I think my view is, as usually, is one of it's. It's all about the balance. I think I don't think it's it's the right way to go. It's like there's two journals and everything else doesn't matter. I don't think that's the right way to go because mm -hmm. I do think there's just a lot of really good research. Just, doesn't make it for some reason, then it goes missing. And I know people that are come from these systems and they literally let their, you know, their work, if it doesn't make an MSQ noise, they just stop that. It's just as if it was never done. So I don't think that can be the right way to go. I've also seen the other side. I see, I know several institutions in, in region two, in region three, for example, of course, that's where I'm from, um, that I always think, geez, you guys could do with more ambition. You know, it's yeah. really easy to be the big fish in the small pond, you know, kind of yeah. like it's really easy to settle on a particular level. And if you don't have that ambition or that pressure or that incentive to actually go higher, you also don't push yourself. I, I, I know several people, I have several in mind, they're like, geez, you could be really good. You could be really successful. But, you know, they don't and they don't want to yeah. and they don't need to. And so they just don't. Yeah. So it's fine. Right. So they probably are very successful. And here's the nice thing is that we'll find their articles. If they're writing good research in a journal that's maybe not MSQ or ISR, we'll, we'll find their articles and we'll... Uh, I'm doing a lit review right now where one of the big conversants were published the paper in Aegis, right? Uh, it's a really nice article. So, so because you, you were pushing this point about career advice, I think my career advice, and I don't think I expressed it quite this way. I think I would always say, well, you want to you wanna show that you could play at that level. Yeah. So this, I think I want to show that you play at that level, but you don't only have to play at that level. That, me, that means you want to show that you can, I don't know, you can publish an ISR, you can publish an MIS quarterly. So you want to, you, you need a few hits there. I do think so. Right. But only yeah. going for them, I think is really detrimental and not going for them at all. It's also really detrimental. So I think you want to play at that level, but as the point that I was pushing, you also want to see that you actually make an impact somewhere. Now that could be to other academics. You know, by by being, I don't know, by, by by pushing theory forward. You know me, that could also be that you leave an impact in the media, in the world, somewhere there. And that's fine as well. As long as you show, you know, that you belong to a certain level and, and, and then you can choose what you really want to do. Yeah. Well, there are a few different arguments based on career goals, right? There, for, so right here in the U.S., I don't know about the rest of the world, but there are schools that you only teach like two or three classes a year and you're paid to do research. And if that's the game you want to play at elite U.S. university, it's not just you have to show you can do that. <clears throat> you have to do that and you have to do it repeatedly because that's the name of the game. Uh, however, there are a lot of universities in the U.S. that, you know, it doesn't really matter that much. 
Uh, we, and if that's, and you have to maybe teach a little bit more, uh, another class or two beyond that. And, and they want to see research, but you know, if you have one MISQ or ISR and then some others, or you, if you have none of those, but a bunch of JS, you'll get tenure and, and you'll have a great career. The question is, why would you go through the process of an MISQ? MISQ is more brutal than the others, right? ISR is more brutal than the others. Why not? have a more direct path to publication, you know, get it in. And uh, there, there's your ego. And I guess if you don't have ego wrapped up in it, you don't really care. You you have your good job. You're teaching cybersecurity and you're enjoying it. You have great students in a great location where you're going to raise your family. Why the hell would you play the elite journal game? I don't think you have to, you know, well, I don't think yeah, it's I, I agree, but, also, I mean, I, I took a little bit of offense because you said, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise people to do anything else but the top journal. That's basically a little bit what you said. And I, I just think that's a that can be a risky <clears> strategy. I see how that could work with some elite high research institution. There's a few of these places, but they're very few. And most other places, you're actually getting unhirable. Like here in Europe, if you come in and you have three management science paper two years out of your PhD, no one will hire you. No, we, no one wants these people when their papers are actually boring. So it all depends. If these are the coolest papers, really interesting ideas, and then top journals, then yeah. But on that, people don't want that. They want someone, you know, no one wants someone that, that publishes only two journal articles. I guess they're great, but they're also kind of boring and they, they do nothing else. Hmm. No. It's not a person well, I would maybe, hire either. And and I don't know what it's like in Germany. I can't imagine someone with three management sciences can be uh, overlooked that easy right out of their PhD. I mean, that's pretty impressive. So the point is, what you're saying is uh, boring research. And and I guess I'm just assuming you're not doing boring research. If what you're <laughs> saying is to get into elite journal, you have to do boring research. So therefore, I think there's boring research in every journal. So what you're saying, the first is, you got to know the incentives of where you're going. If you're playing at University of Notre Dame or before I was at University of Georgia or wherever, uh, you need top journal publications. Now, both of those schools here at Notre Dame and, and at Georgia will value an interesting article written at another outlet. Uh, but you'll get tenure showing you can repeatedly do publications at an elite level. And I agree with you. If it's boring ass stuff, yeah, you won't get hired. So I'm assuming it has to be interesting, number one, uh, it, interesting, relevant. Something's got to be compelling about it. It can't just be naval. And, and, it, and, and when you say that, it means it, it has to fit with the research. So what you and I might consider boring, you go to another school uh, and that's the research they do. They might think that person's yeah, doing really course. exciting work. So yeah. a lot of times what you say boring, uh, maybe the point is it's just not a fit with that university because the professors who are there can't see the what's cool about it. So I, I want to flip this around a little bit because, you know, I've been in, in Germany, at least uh, Cologne and Hamburg. These are two of the, the top five business schools in Germany, right? So there's, there's Munich and, and Mannheim as well. But, you know, these two are also always there. So I'd flip this around to get a professor position at any of these two where I've seen it, right? And been in these committees is you need to have a, a certain number of hits. You need a number of A plus journals. You do need that. Otherwise, you're not in contention. That's simple, right? So you, you do need two, three, four, depending on what level of professor you want. If you want to be a full professor in Cologne, you want to have four to six A journal. Simple. Yeah. yeah. So that's it, but that's not enough. Then it has to be interesting. I've seen this, I've yeah. uh, been in these comedies and they talk about either this stuff is boring, this person is boring, I don't want to work with this person, etc. So yeah. um, so one of them is the hygiene factor, the other one is the excitement factor. But it's not it's got to be interesting, and then it's got to be good. No, it has to be good and then it has to be interesting. I think that's that's how yeah. I would look at it here. Um, and Hamburg is certainly the same, yeah. So and I would say what you just said, four to six, uh, that's to get tenure in a U.S. system at a research school. Four to six MISQs and ISRs are equivalent, right? Org sci, management science, whatever. Uh, and then you need to show a pipeline and you need to be a good person, right? Like if you have the four to six and you're a jerk and yeah, you're no a really bad right. teacher, yeah, they don't want to give you a tenure, right? Uh, and then you pretty much have to double whatever you did for tenure for a full professor. So... Uh, if it's four to six, it's going to be somewhere between eight and 12 to be a full professor at a, well, a yeah. and that's the rule of thumb. It can be more. I've heard of people getting turned down for tenure with 10 a hits. I've heard of, um, uh, a variety of things. And, and that's because the whole package comes in, including, is this person doing interesting work? Are they doing original work? 
Uh, are they a good colleague? And do they teach? Uh, you know, in the end, I we think do this te- being a good colleague is a huge thing. And yeah. it makes sense. It makes sense because, uh, you know, who wants to have, you know, tenure or Germany, if I'm doing, you know, like this means th- these people have jobs for life. They're going to be there for life. That's at least the idea. Some of them move at some stage. But the idea is that you're hiring someone for decades. Who wants to work next to an asshole? You know, I'll tell you what, and, and I know you and I might disagree on this one, uh, but I think one of the things about being a good colleague is being there. And I realize yeah. that the big trend right now in universities, because we can work v- virtually so much, we can be away, we yeah. uh, people travel. And I know stories of, of people who live across the country from where they're supposedly working. And, uh, and I can think of multiple such situations. I can think of a university that gave someone a chair and the guy never moved there. And he's a, a nice long flight between the, the place where he uh, lives and where yeah, they where hire him. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know. What do you think about that? What do you think? Because I'll tell you, before simple I ask you, I know. Yeah, no, before no. I ask you, I think that when you hire someone for your university, university is a place. It's not virtual yet. And that place has PhD students, it has undergrad students, and it has colleagues. It has senior colleagues and junior colleagues. I know. Either whether you're a junior or a senior person, you want to be there. You want to go to lunch with people. You want to be there for the PhD students to meet with them in person, have a beer with someone or a coffee with someone every once in a while. There has to be building of community. And I think all of these virtual uh, mercenaries that just show up, teach their class and fly back to wherever they're from, uh, that is a disservice. You're, You're giving your university a disservice, you know, but I think it's an increasing trend. Well, admittedly, I fully agree with you. And I say that very knowingly that I'm one of these mercenaries. I am. Um, And this is the Mm. biggest struggle in my life right now, that I am actually, for the first time in my life, I'm not living where I work. Um, And there's there's a few reasons for that. One of them very simply is I can't live, we can't live the way we want to live at the place where I work. And where we want to live, we can't work. You're an hour long train ride from there. It's almost yeah. like you're in an extended suburb. So you're not who I'm talking about. If you need to be there in an no, but hour it is, But I see hours, the same issue. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I do that and I am, but it's still the same issue. This is the biggest issue. Exactly that community building is incredibly difficult because I'm not there all the time. And this is the biggest worry yeah. and the thing that I literally put the most effort in, like with my mm-hmm. team, but also with my colleagues and with other juniors. So most of the stuff that we do, and you've been there, we, you visited us, I invite yeah. literally the entire university. I invite people from universities of, from the region. I say, like, everybody come. Also, because I'm not there all the time. So please come. Let's build more community while we're there. And let's also make sure we go and have a beer and, you know, whatever and, and stuff like this. Because this is really, in the normal day-to-day, this is the, the biggest uh, loss. And this is the biggest compromise that we're making in our life and in, in my professional life as well. And it's just, you know, every now and then you have to find a configuration. It's not going to be always optimal. Um, and I'm, we made a conscious decision that that's one of the aspects I'm going to sacrifice. I'm not happy about it, but I'm happy about some of the other things that, that allows me to do. Yeah, but you, you know enough to find a good, uh, what, Her- Heron Gedick? What Heron-Gedick. were we drinking? <laughs> that was the greatest, my new favorite thing. We, in are, we, are, we are not espousing alcohol on this very important podcast here. What was the name of that bar we went to? Uh, it was, co- uh, oh, I, ca- I can't remember. I'll look it up. We'll put it on the show notes. Yeah, put it on the show notes. It was phenomenal. It's this little hole in the wall bar. We yeah. walk in there and they're like, all right, Heron Gedick. So there's a little schnapps and it's like five different schnapses. And there are five different beers. They give you Matching your beer. beer. They match the beer with the schnapps. They match the, the, the flavor profile. And then a little, what, piece of bread and then some pickles and stuff. Uh, that was Amazing. One of my favorite things uh, I've had this year so far. It was totally yeah. fun. It was fantastic. Um, it, it was indeed having it acted. So um, I think we got to keep continuing that series with the uh, journal editors and chiefs, right? I thought that was really yeah. amazing. Uh, we learned so much, especially the one with Dorothy, when the end of the episode, I said, people, you know, if you've just listened to this, rewind and listen to it again. Uh, it, it was the a gem article. of an episode. I mean, just the thing she said about the literature review that blew my mind away. Yeah. You know, like what's yeah. been done, what's been found, and what does it mean? It's fantastic. It's like the best that advice the I could ever thing. give. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we got to continue that at some stage. Um, but I thought, you know, today we just we just tied up some loose ends, right? So I mean, so there's one more thing that you right, brought up after uh, ABJ's talk with you with us. 
uh, where he said we should go after theory. And if you want to make your mark, you ha- and, and you didn't necessarily like that. You had another idea. What was, I mean, you you are always pushing back on theory. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, you appreciate theory. And, and we've had episodes, we've talked about theory. I, of course, am a big believer in theory, and I'm almost too strict in theory because I think it's, it's, it represents abstracted knowledge, the cumulative tradition. It distinguishes us from practitioners and from charlatans and from anybody off the street is our understanding of the cumulative tradition of abstracted knowledge. And we bring that to bear on what we do. So unless you're making a theoretical contribution, you can't really call yourself much of a, a scholar, I would say, you know, from a, from that standpoint, you might be doing research, you might be doing interesting things, but you know, if you're going to elevate your game, you have to contribute to the, so I think, I believe in theory. And I also think it's the, I can take different methods and I'm, I'm decent at theory. And I think that's been my strategic competitive advantage over the years is it has, and you've done it well, but, but it's, yeah. it's, a, I think it's just a dangerous piece of advice because the reality is a little bit what Andrew alluded to that, it's very difficult to you know, focus on theory and be generative with it. Most people that focus on theory do basically kitchen, gravity in the kitchen with it. They yeah. show like, hey, this is a complex system. Hey, guess what? This is an actor network. Hey, guess what? This is institutional something, something, right? And so that's what most people are doing. Now, you might be one of the few that actually does it generatively and you actually learn something new about institutions, by the way, that you apply to chief digital officers and you know, escalation and whatever mm-hmm. else you're doing, um, but it's incredibly hard. So I said a little bit with Andrew. The funny thing is both Andrew and I have worked for a long time with the same theoretical base, representation theory. So when he yeah. said he felt that he was getting really good at answering questions but not coming up with new questions, I knew what he meant. I I mm-hmm. also thought at some stage, so the way that I would put it is, for a long time I felt like I can take representation theory modeling do an experiment and get this published in the highest journal you know like that would fly <laughs> and it flies to mm-hmm. the year 2021 you can still write about representation theory in MS quarterly you can do that mm-hmm. but at some stage I feel like well it's kind of you know it's very detached from the real world like a lot of that stuff doesn't really matter all that much whether there's a cardinality of zero and n on that little box in that arrow like who cares yeah so yeah. So you can take this theory, it's very theoretical work. You can make lots of theoretical contributions there. But it, yeah, so I, I, I felt it wasn't important enough and maybe it wasn't generative enough. So yeah, I can answer questions with this theory and I know it inside out and so forth, but I didn't want to do that anymore. And so, so what you're enough, saying is just theory, just theory on its own, being a master of theory <clears throat> is not a competitive advantage unless you can do something with it and unless it can be applied in relevant contexts, right? I, a, that. B, I also think it depends <clears throat> on the, the theory, to be honest. Yeah, so institutional mm-hmm. theory is a very different theory, for example, from representation theory. Like very different yeah. level of abstraction, very different scope, I would say, where we, it could yeah. be applied. So that might be in it. And the third thing is there's this really big risk and danger that you're doing, that you're falling into this gravity in the kitchen um, uh, hole, and that is really difficult to get out of there because you don't want to end up yeah. there. You don't want to be the guy that applies it everywhere and everyone was because it's actually you say you can make theoretical contribution true, but it's really really difficult. I think you're right because what if what if you decided to read and really become an expert on the theory of planned behavior? Right. And and really understand that to cycle. And right now, right, where we've beaten up the theory so badly and it's like, what can you do with it? You can't squeeze any more out of that worldview in our field, I don't think. Uh, maybe someone will. Yeah. But yeah, so I think you're right. I think that when we say theory, it's not all theories and theoretical perspectives are They're equal. They're not all equal. Exactly not. And I would, if someone asked me, should I go with complex adaptive system? I would always say no, because everything is like, mm. it's too general. It applies to everything. It's the same, my actor, actor network theory, I don't I don't like it because it's, 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 it's everything and nothing. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think it's very generative either. So it can be very dangerous. Um, so you, 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 you do well, I think, because first of all, maybe you, you have a knack for uh, finding the interesting questions. Maybe you had a knack or luck in picking a good theory. Uh, the phenomenon driven is also very dangerous because f- phenomenon are fickle and, uh, you can run into, you know, running after every fad that comes along. I think that's the biggest danger there. That there's always going to be the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's really hard to buy, build up any identity. So I guess, and you alluded to it a little bit. The big thing is, of course, 
to connect theory and phenomenon. I'm just saying you can come on yeah. it from both angles. You can start with the phenomenon, bring theory in it, or you can start with theory and bring phenomenon into it, whatever. But I think this relationship has to be there, right? I think that's probably yeah, that's interesting. Advice. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think the one thing I took away from today is that some theories are... <laughs> Maybe we should do a future podcast on that. Do our homework and think, what are theories? So I'll give you an example. We kind of do a ranking of theories. We've got to come up with the best theory. Well, what are promising? (laughs) And, uh, and, you know, of course, institutional theory is fine, but institutional theory is becoming everything. And there's so many little variants of it. You can't become an expert on institutional theory now. You have to pick an area in institutional theory to become an expert, right? Translation theory or or logics or something, right? Uh, I, I like modularity theory i think there's that's a good place for us to play it works Mm. with platforms it works with a lot and the nice thing about modularity is if you look at strategy research or you know organizational research the only way they think of technology is through modularity so do you mean like baldwin and clark kind of modularity yeah yeah. okay yeah exactly Okay. Uh, yeah, that's some powerful stuff there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And there's still a lot of room in the future. Yeah. I think if you're going cognitive right now, the you know Thomas uh, Grizzled has his predictive mind uh, theory that he and I are are working on some stuff. He introduced me to, uh, and I think that is a cognitive theory. It's a predictive mind. It's exactly what it sounds like, right? So imagine uh, uh, thinking of the human brain as a neural net that's doing little predictions, right? So how would that change what you do as a when you interact with humans, right? So oh. so I think that's a really generative, forward looking theory. Um, we should do that. We should do an episode on what are some of the theoretical bases that are forward looking and interesting and maybe uh, more likely to be generative. And as a last idea, uh, we can do this, or maybe some of our followers or some of our listeners have some ideas on this. It was also interesting that we had different quality criteria, right? So Andrew was pushing this idea of a theory has to be generative. I, in my work, yeah. I always thought of it, a theory has to be fertile. And what I meant with this is it has to be, for me, logically easily possible to construct a hypothesis from the theory. You know, yeah. if this is true, then this and this should occur kind of thing. That That's what I mean with fertility. He means something else with generativity. He means asking new questions. Now, uh, Dorothy also said something interesting. And then she said, well, what we do all the time, we take Bacharach. Yeah, parsimony, mm-hmm. blah blah blah, and uh, it doesn't fit to all all theories. Now that may got me thinking as well. Then the question would be, what are the right criteria to use to evaluate different theories of different kinds? Anyway, so I think we got some homework to do, you and I. <laughs> yeah, the other one that I was just thinking of is, and Young Jin introduced me to Delanda, and uh, Delanda and Gut, Gut, whoever, someone, and uh, they they kind of interpret Deleuze, who's one of those obfuscatory Frenchmen. They're, they're too uh, difficult, man. <laughs> But but so and Young Jin has kind of sold me and I've done a little bit of reading. And I think what's happening now is people are dumbing down Delanda enough for people to handle. And I think there's some generative, you know, some generative. So, so you mean like I can too. get into mm-hmm. Delanda and Deleuze because I, I yeah. wouldn't touch that. Well, not Deleuze. <laughs> but so I think Delanda is becoming the new, I don't know, critical realism. It's like critical realism 20 years ago was kind of dumbed down by uh, Mingers well, and some true. other folks. Yeah. They right. They they made it uh, accessible so that the common man can use it. I think that's kind of what's happening now with Delanda uh, and and those guys. So I don't know. All right. So we should wrap up. Dude, we wanted to do a quick episode. This is going to be extremely long. And is it this too is, long? Yeah, it's long. And, it's, and, long and it's, it's all over the place. <laughs> it's completely yeah. all over the place. Do we have a conclusion here? I think I, I expected us to get into a fight today. But we actually we settled no. on agreements, right? We we basically agreed on the basket and what we think about the extension and, and the meaning of journalists and stuff. Uh, we agreed on on how to how to what what a good career advice is and sort of like you know put in more nuance in some of the things we said. So I think that's good. And uh, we even found a new topic to talk about. <laughs> yeah, and the only thing we're going to fight about is if people seem to think you're the alpha male in this group, I'm going to have to. I'm going to be insecure, and I'm going to have to prove myself. And, and also, if violence. they think that I'm the elitist, then you're not, because you're totally the elitist. Yeah. Like you're totally. No, I'm not. Elitist. I'm a. I'm. Hey, I was just introduced. I'm the the common man. What was I? You're the man of the people. Yeah, the man of the people. That's what I'm going to call this episode. I'm going to call it no. the title of this episode will be The Man of the People. Nick Comma, the, the Man of the People. The Alpha Man of the People. The Alpha Man alpha of man. the People. <laughs> All, right. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Nick, good talking to you. We'll we'll get on with this as usual. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye.